greetings and welcome to uh, another LGR Vintage Computer Festival Midwest thing. Yeah, going to the show again with my brother to film the whole experience and this time it's not just one video but two. So you have a choice this time around. Over on LGR Blurbs is a completely different type of video than I've made before. It's just a straight up like travel vlog. Two and a half hours of the entire trip over two weeks of just stuff happening uh, at VCF Midwest, but before and after in Chicago and traveling and just all kinds of things is very much just a day to day like here's what happens on one of these types of trips uh, videos. And then this one that you're watching now is gonna be um, obviously much shorter and uh, just going over the show itself, really focusing on the VCF Midwest experience as it was in 2023. And um, on that note, I've been asked by people behind the show to be totally honest, you know, very upfront about any critiques or thoughts or, you know, the good and the bad, just whatever. I'm gonna lay it out there. So uh, yeah, this is gonna have a, a little bit of that as well. And um, yeah, and just my general thoughts on how it went as well as uh, what we're gonna start with. And that is before the show, because there's always a lot of prep work involved getting all of these LGR things ready to take all the way up to Chicago. Now, as for the pre-show prep work and all my excitement, I made it far more complicated this time with the addition of the Barabite PC in the Oddware Tower, alongside the old wood grain 486 as always. They all needed testing to get ready for the show as usual, which mostly involves making sure the darn things still work, but each system also needed a table placard thing so people at the show could see their specs and story if they hadn't seen my videos. So I made those up and printed them out real quick. And there were specific areas of attention to address on each system, like how I wanted to upgrade the bare PC with the GPU to ensure people could play accelerated 3D games at the show. I made a whole video about that in case you missed it, so I won't dwell on the process here. The Oddware Tower was mostly ready to go, I just needed to make sure all that spaghetti was still correctly hooked up, and of course the cigarette lighter needed to be disconnected for safety's sake. I considered leaving it on and just using it to power random 12 volt devices or something, but eh, I'd rather not push my luck. Besides, the wood grain 486 needed more attention than I thought, since I'd forgotten about removing the sound card and stuff for another project, so it needed the Orpheus 1 card put back in place, plus all the drivers and software reconfigured again, which thankfully isn't too big a deal since I keep hard disk images of everything for exactly this purpose. Another system that needed work was the ridiculous pointy pyramid PC. You haven't seen that in a while, huh? Not something I was going to have at my table, but instead something to be auctioned off. Yeah, I haven't used this thing since doing that video, and it's all huge, taking up space, and deserves a new home. So I decided to donate it to the VCF Midwest Auction and give them the proceeds. It's one of the primary ways they raise money for the show, since the entire event is still completely free somehow. The main thing I needed to do was clear off any personal info and whatnot, and also let it update everything. All the drivers and software and Linux stuff was about three years out of date. I also took the opportunity to install some RGB speakers I got for it a while back, since I always thought it'd be neat to have the sound come from inside, and hey, why not more ridiculous RGB? And also picked up this little glass pyramid and mounted that in the pyramid too, cause yo dog, I heard you like pyramids. And it's kind of mesmerizing with all the animated lighting too. Then there was the LGR merchandise side of things, which was pretty much all new this time around. I still had crab stickers and patches left over, but I've spent the last few months sourcing new stuff, like shinier holographic LGR decals, a run of cute little cool crab keychains, freshly redesigned LGR case badges made in collaboration with Geekenspiel, plus what I'm most excited for, the first run of LGR wear. MS-DOS shareware games on floppy disk. Now these are physical working three and a half inch floppies containing classic PC shareware from the 90s, many of which I've featured on LGR. In accordance with old vendor agreements, you're allowed to sell shareware for the cost of materials, which is what countless vendors did back in the day, so I'm bringing it back. And after getting all the right files for each specific version of the games I wanted and testing the installers, I got to work writing all the discs. 
no small task. <laughs> I do at least have a double speed USB floppy drive, so that helped, but it still took a solid couple days to test, format, and write 140 something discs. Next came designing the labels, which I kept simple and monochrome, but in line with the way many vendors did it back in the day. And I found these spice container labels, which it turns out are the exact size needed for three and a half inch floppy disks too. They only go on the front of the disk and don't wrap around how I might have liked, but they did the job nicely. And since they were new, the adhesive is still nice and sticky, which is why I didn't try and go for old stock labels. I've tried that before and they came off far too easily, especially in warm environments. They of course needed some packaging and artwork, and I looked at a few different things over the past few months, but came up with this solution here. These transparent cookie bags are darn near the perfect size for three and a half inch discs plus artwork, and they even have a pre-punched hole above the Ziploc top. Perfect for this spinny pegboard retail display thing I found a while back. As for the artwork, I really wanted to print borderless and avoid doing any cutting since that only adds time to the process. And then I found these. They're three and a half inch square sheets of photo paper, which not only fit the size of the discs, but also slide snugly into those cookie bags. Only problem is you need a specific model of printer to properly print on them without borders. So yep, I bought the dang printer. After that, it was just a matter of putting all the pieces together inside of the bags, which in and of itself was not the smoothest process. Those bags could stand to be like an eighth of an inch larger, but ah oh well, the results are nice. And I was able to get 10 copies of each game on each peg, with six games on two sides for a total of 12 titles. The third side is for the price list. Oh, and at the last minute, I got a roll of these made for extra authenticity. These little certified virus-free stickers, which you often saw back in the day on shareware sold in stores. If I was thinking, I would have included this on the artwork, but putting stickers on the bags was a nice effect, and I'm glad I did it. Eventually, I got everything crammed into the car the night before leaving, and it was quite a bit more cramped this time due to the bulky additions of the Pyramid, the Bear, and the Tower of Oddness. But at least the Pyramid will be going home with someone else once we're done. And yeah, so begins the roughly 11-hour road trip from North Carolina to Chicago. Though it ended up being closer to 10 hours this time since I took a slightly different route and managed to avoid bad traffic and yep, it was just me driving up alone here. My brother Luke flew up separately from his home in Virginia and checked in early to our first hotel downtown, which yeah, that's another thing. This time around we decided to do all of our Chicago vacationing and sightseeing before VCF instead of after giving us a good three and a half days in the city before heading off to Elmhurst to set up for the show. For more on all of that, and <laughs> much, much more, you can watch the aforementioned vlog that shows the trip up there, our time in the city, and a whole lot more VCF Midwest as well, but to sum things up, doing all the touristy stuff before the show was absolutely the right move since we're always half dead after the madness of the festival. I felt significantly more relaxed and ready for the show as a result, too. Anyway, yeah, Chicago was welcoming and entertaining and absurd as always, but Thursday it was time to check out of the Regency and into the Clarion. With everything happening once more at the Waterford Banquet and Conference Center and visitors staying at the Clarion Inn Elmhurst Hotel. At least if you were lucky enough to get a room, that is. I reserved hours back in the first week of April, but I know people who've attended the show for years who couldn't get one. It sold out fast this time, so there were two assigned overflow hotels, which by all accounts were pretty packed as well. But yeah, once it was time to unload, it was the standard process for the most part. We had two tables this time, which I requested due to the sheer size of the bear, but also because I really needed a spot to meet people, sign stuff, take selfies, sell things, and so on. For now, though, it was the calm before the storm, just setting up, testing, and troubleshooting things at the table. Something that always takes longer than you'd think. Lots of friends and fellow exhibitors take the opportunity to say hi and get their own selfies and stuff signed here, and that's more than fine, but they also don't seem to vet everyone, so there's always a few dozen regular visitors that wander inside as well. 
So like last year, I ended up with a small line forming to see me before the show even opened. I'm happy to oblige, but this happens each year and I wish they vetted building entrance during setup. Like make us wear exhibitor badges the way other shows do. It's a security issue since who knows who's wandering in at night and it makes me anxious leaving my table. The bigger the show, the more chances stuff can happen, and I feel some checks need to be introduced during setup period. Anyway, we eventually got all set up, and after that we were invited over to Jim Leonard's. Vintage computing legend and friend of the channel and all-around awesome dude behind a lot of things at the show, and yeah, anyway, he just invited a bunch of folks over to hang out with some good pizza and good company and unwind a bit, taking a look at all the random awesome stuff in his collection. I always admire what he's done with the space that he has. Finally walking the line of collecting without going over into hoarding, I can relate. After another couple hours hanging out enjoying the show floor till things closed down, it was on to bed. Followed by the first full day of the show on Saturday. And wow, I was expecting the usual madness, but this 18th VCF Midwest was truly absurd. Just take a look at this line out front, jeez. Far as I know, this was only the queue for the t-shirt sales, the official VCF merch and whatnot. The show itself is free and there aren't even tickets, just badges that are encouraged but not strictly enforced. So folks can simply head inside without question. Makes me wonder if everyone in line realized that or not. But either way, wow, what a crowd. It's estimated there were a few thousand visitors over the weekend, but yeah, lacking ticket or badge counts makes precise numbers elusive. Either way, the hallways were clearly more packed than before, with both visitors and tables alike. Vendor and exhibitor reservations were claimed faster than ever this year, so they increased the number of tables any way they could. Which not only meant moving panels downstairs, down a spiral staircase, into a room that was previously unused by the show, but it also meant just about anywhere that could fit a table had a table. Including halls inside the hotel near the cafe, which held a soldering and repair workshop, as well as a sweet PC gaming LAN party setup. Finally, I've said we needed this for years. Yeah, I didn't get to play nearly as much as I'd like, but it was a real treat playing Unreal Tournament with opponents sitting shoulder to shoulder, talking trash and racking up frags. My brother got in on the action too, which sure did bring up some vivid high school memories. Good quality stuff, man. Back out into the bunker's hallway though, and down to the end, where the free pile normally resides. And it did again this year, just a giant grab bag of goodies for anyone to leave stuff and take stuff free of charge. But it soon became so sprawling and cumbersome that they actually moved a good chunk of it outside. Right around the corner on the other side of the hallway windows. I don't know what they would have done if it started raining, but yeah, it was a hot, sunny day, so if you're willing to roast a bit, then the gargantuan growing free pile was a great place to be. Confusingly though, it wasn't all free this time, or at least it wasn't super clear where the freebies ended and the paid stuff began. Because right at the end of the free pile was another pile of items for sale, continuing on down the lawn. And yeah, this was a whole nother side of the show this time. The relative lack of tables for people to set up inside meant that tons of folks brought their own tables and set up outside. I know a good number of sellers cleared this with the people in charge, but from what I learned through discussions later on, it seems that this really became a free-for-all in terms of people setting up as they pleased. Now the parking lots, the sidewalks, the grass, and along the street became an outdoor flea market. A kind of car boot sale slash swap meet slash ham fest extravaganza that was actually kind of awesome. Also an inconvenience for anyone trying to park and a bit sketch if you consider the liabilities, but still really fun to witness nonetheless. As for the core of the show, it's back inside with exhibitors and vendors helming tables throughout each conference room of which there are now four, with an additional room gained over last year due to the VCF auction and panels being moved downstairs. This time around, the YouTuber types were spread out a bit more, with me and Computer Clan side by side, Ben Heck and the 8-bit guy in the same area in the next room over, and many more creators scattered around in the corners. This certainly kept lines from merging together as much, but this still needs some tweaking. 
Especially at my own table where folks got confused about where the line began or ended or if there was one at all. Without any kind of line indicators, either taped on the floor or roped off cues or something, people were left fending for themselves trying to reach my table. Or skipping line entirely, since there was no official line. It just came up to my left instead of my right. Still, most people who wanted to come up and talk were able to do so, eventually. At least when conversations weren't cut short by loud announcements. Some of us try to take advantage of Donald Trump, and I know, I know you're sitting out there, guy who bought Apple on the dip before they brought Steve Jobs back. You are out there. You have $375. You Don't get me wrong, I get their purpose, especially back when VCF Midwest consisted of several hundred visitors, but with several thousand? It'd make more sense if announcements were kept brief. Because it sucks not being able to hear the people in front of me who've been waiting ages in line to talk feels like a vestigial sign of how this used to be a small show that's rapidly grown into a big one and hasn't fully adjusted yet. On a related note, how about that YouTuber panel? From my perspective, I thought it went really well, but once again, it quickly ended up being a standing room only situation due to the smaller venue, so at least there's a recording of the hour and a half affair over on the VCF Midwest YouTube channel, so head over there and check it out if you missed it live. The fundraiser auction also happened in this room, which isn't something I got to witness myself since I was manning my table, but it's always fun to see what comes up for sale. With everything from rare mini-computer hardware to ridiculous pointy pyramids made by YouTubers with little impulse control, yeah, the LGR Pyramid PC is now sold and gone. I believe it went for $210. I think that's what I heard. I wasn't there, but thankfully Steve of the channel Mac84 filmed part of it and sent over this footage. I tracked down Matt, the guy who bought it, to get it signed later on too, as we just happened to see him carting it off that night. No clue if he plans to sell it or keep it, but hey, props to you sir for giving the pyramid a new life. As for the rest of the show floor, well, I really wish I was able to get around to see all of it myself in detail, but that is unfortunately not possible. Even at the end of the day, or when Luke's taking care of the table, it's just the kind of show where I can't walk two feet without someone stopping me for a selfie or signature conversation. Which is exactly why I'm there, so zero complaints. I can at least give some general thoughts on the show itself. Which, despite the understandable growing pains and massive need for a more suitable venue, VCF Midwest is still truly something special. The entire weekend is a loving celebration of technological obsolescence, or perhaps more accurately, an outright rejection of it, where passionate enthusiasts gather to show just how much they refuse to let these systems become useless and die. I often get comments and questions on these videos asking, why? Why bother with all this old junk, as they say? And well, as with so many niche hobbies, one person's trash is another person's weekend project that spiraled out of control and turned into a years-long obsession. Vintage computing is a lot of things to a lot of folks, and you really only get out of it what you put in. So on the surface, sure, no one needs a goofy monochrome business machine from 40 years ago, but... What if you could find the original software it was designed for and get that going, or play games on a thing that was never designed to handle anything but equations? Or you find a way to run modern machine learning models on it, or you just think it looks neat and like having it as a piece of modern art. Any reason at all is valid for enjoying this stuff, and every single person here has justified it in their own ways. There's always a unique story of acquisition, a homebrew project that brought it back to life for a new modern use case for it. It makes sense, right? If someone went out of their way to haul cranky old stuff to a show, then there's a darn good reason. Practically every machine you see is someone's pride and joy, the most unique and noteworthy items in their collection. Otherwise, they wouldn't have brought it out here at all. Which leads to a bizarre effect where, because everything is special, it's kind of like nothing is. And browsing VCF, you're hit with a counterintuitive blasé feeling after a while. It's the same sort of feeling I get visiting huge art museums, where seeing so much priceless awesome stuff at once leads to a kind of museum fatigue. And I end up missing some of the best stuff because it's right under my nose, surrounded by all the other best stuff. 
And of course, I thankfully got first-hand details of several nifty things, including, but not limited to, this crusty Macintosh dug up out of the ground. The Passport Designs Sound Chaser synthesizer for the Apple II, the hand-wound paper tape reader for the Altair 8800 and its clones. These awesome palm top PC-110 case swaps officially sold by IBM in Japan. Some early 2000s Alienware Area 51s that have become surprisingly rare to see still working. This phenomenal preservation of Yamaha OPL FM synth music via the OPL archive. This fantastic selection of Macintosh breakout PCBs and adapters for more convenient interfacing. Compact Flash and MPU-401 MIDI boards for the Epson QX10 of all things. This beautiful tribute to turn of the millennium aesthetics with everything in translucent teal. A most excellent digital guest book taking place on a 32K Chromimco system and writing to this absolute unit of a Winchester hard drive. A torturously restored PDP-11 connected to a paper tape puncher that you can make say whatever you want. They even had the famous Topo robot wheeling around out and about for the first time I've seen. It was its 40th birthday this year, so hey, what better reason to get out and go party? But yeah, these things were only scratching the surface. There's obviously much, much more to see and do. I lament being unable to easily stroll around and investigate everything while I'm there, but hey, chances are you can. So hopefully this footage conveys the vibe well enough for you to plan on attending yourself. It can still be a bit of a madhouse, but it's also pure infectious joy that has to be experienced in person. And I've no doubt it'll only get better from here. And that is it for Vintage Computer Festival Midwest 2023. For this video at least, once again, I also have the vlog video over on LGR Blurbs where the convention is still a core part of it, but it's largely the rest of the trip surrounding it. Covering a good two weeks of stuff before, during, and after the show. That being said, the very best part of this trip is always getting to meet so many of you, whether it's on the windy streets of Chicago or the crowded halls of Elmhurst. I am legitimately fortunate to have made so many genuine connections this year and previous years, and I'll truly miss attending in 2024. The showrunners are clearly doing their best with a convention that's outgrown its britches. But whether or not they get a new venue soon, I simply want to give it time to breathe and come back with fresh eyes in a couple years. That and my plan for 24 is to visit other VCFs and events that I've never been to before. For now, though, I hope you enjoyed this episode, and a big shout-out to everyone I got to meet and hang out with, and to all who generously dropped off things at my table. A bunch of you I met and took down your name, but a bunch of you I didn't, either due to the frantic busy nature of the show or I was elsewhere when you came by, so if you provided one of the things that you see here, do feel free to let me know who you are in the comments or through email, and I'll be sure you're accredited if things end up featured in a future video. As always, though, thank you very much for watching and for your support, and here's to even better VCF Midwest shows in the future, whatever form they take. <laughs>